Hey, Patreon listeners. We just wanted to give a shout out to our brand new Scout member, Choman Z. Thanks for joining our Patreon. Yes, absolutely. In today's episode, we chat with Julio and Sawyer again, who we chatted with last year. Um, this time, chatting about Legionary and Hunter Clade. Here's the episode. We're back talking with Peru. I mean, last year, you know, we did this around the same, a little bit around the same, <laughs> not quite, but, you know, I think it's been a long time since we talked. And the last time we talked, we did talk about intercession being a big thing. And now we've got Legionary Unchained and Jason still running around in the background playing intercession, doing yep, we're bringing Jason them back. things. That's, with, that's been my uh, big fun thing I've been doing. I, even today, I played two kill, uh, two games of Kill Team just today. And both nice. Them, yep. Um, both the of them. Yep, with intercession, both of them I did all auto bolt rifles and um, all engage nice. orders and just clean sweep took both wins. Wow, nice, it was nice, right. nice, nice strat. Or have you have you switched it up? Um, I have switched it up. So this time, um, I don't even bring the chainsword guy that has the free grenades just because I like to have range on everybody. Uh, auto mm -hmm. bolt rifles on everyone so that you can fish for crits and then I take a uh, deadly sharpshooter so it's your bolt rifles become three three mortal wounds one and mobile so you can fall back for one APL everyone's on engage order and then you just flood the board with shooting threat the same way I was doing with incursors um, but now you just wow. get a billion rerolls and you can shoot on death and you can angels of death um, and then the last one I, I the last thing I changed was I brought three tilting shields so people can't even bully you in melee you just like oh, wow. put an immovable threat in the middle of the board and then just never stop shooting. Yeah, no, nice. That's, that's quite strange. If it works for you, then yeah. <laughs> yeah. By all means. Yeah. It worked at LVO. I think the best part about this whole year long journey is, you know, we went from like, ah, oh, this is a, this seems kind of like a meme. And then Jason went to LVO, did really well, actually was part of how Adrian managed to get first place because. He tied Vivek <laughs> in a game. Yep, and that's what nice. kept him from getting uh, second place instead of first. <laughs> that allowed him to my get first on ITC because of this tie. <laughs> really? Wow. <laughs> yes, it was a wild twist of a change of events that allowed Adrian to get first on ITC and first at LVO because the final record came down to him and Vivek with the exact same record, except Adrian had two more points. So that tie wow. was critical. <laughs> Whoa! Amazing, yeah. and you dethroned Ace. Yep, and Jason. Jason was in the background there with his his Doom Bolter and five assault sword chain, assault sword Marines just running around. It was like Doom Bolter, the Gunner, and four chain swords. But yeah, just doing their things like good Marines. Yeah, good Marines. Yeah, Bolter discipline. Yep. <laughs> Go <bro. laughs> No breaks on the bolt gun train. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's actually it's pretty funny. So that what that's been Jason's intercession journey over the last like year. He's just been and now we're back full circle. But one of the reasons why we wanted to bring you guys back on is not just because it's been a year since we touched Peru and we wanted to see how the scene has been going for you guys. And you know, with the world championships coming up, it'd be fun to touch base with you guys. Uh, but also because you know, you guys have been playing Legionary and Hunter Clay, two teams that I think we both are interested in hearing about. Legionary, especially because they now have their rosters unchained. I don't know how many people are still playing them. You know, with Night Lords running around as the big fun team for the elites. But I was curious how Legionary were doing. So it fi we figured we'd check in with Peru and uh, get the skinny on what's been going on with the uh, Chaos Marines. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So uh, do you want me to start? Yeah. But yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um well legionaries is uh I, I I pick I pick up legionaries because I consider it also very, very fun because I was I was playing intercessors uh, all the last year until the wars. Um I believe uh, legionaries have a lot of possibilities, have a lot of potentials because you have uh well, they had a lot of potential because right now they can achieve that that all that potential in one rooster finally. Yep. Because you sometimes you you pick a main god. In my case, it's Nargle. I'm sorry if some, that's boring, <laughs> but I believe Nargle is some it's kind of boring for a lot of people. But I don't know. Yeah. I, it's my favorite god for lore eventually, right? Uh, but I like to mix it with sometimes with corn or sometimes with slanch. Because I can only pick, pick both the 
that that got uh, the other two gods, right? Well, well. You Corn can have Zinch, but Zinch. Zinch is going to be coming out in lieu of using Nurgle, so then the rest of, of your course. squad's got to be ready. So I believe that most people who play Legionary, even now when I look at rosters, you do have kind of one main god, and then you pick the best parts of the other gods. Maybe you have two main gods, so you can take the two pivot gods. So if you have a couple Nurgle as your front line, then in some matchups you would have just like three Zinch, and then you're hoping that the three corn kind of carry the other part of your squad. <laughs> yeah. So... It sounds like you've been using Nurgle as the as the big break. Yes, uh, so in, in sometimes in a tournament I I went for Nurgle, and it works. <laughs> but against some factions, I I miss to have Singe and Corn because against especially a one a team with seven wounds or less or eight uh, even eight wounds or less, and and then primary weapons are ball guns or damage three or less. Nurgle lose lucid efficiency except in the overwatch and the other stuff right uh, not being injured but corn as, and and singe works a lot with the crits so half a, a, a acolyte with a with a mark of singe is a bomb really mm -hmm. so yeah you start to miss uh, I, I believe the the Rus, uh, the legionaries before the this this up uh, did this buff lose a lot of that potential but right now you can mix all the gods, so it's amazing. So you can you can do a, a lot of terrible things right now. So that's that's very good. And I I don't know how it's the meta in other in other countries, but right now in Peru it's very mixed between elites and and, and hard players or yeah. mid and hard players. So like Javier, who is playing <laughs> the other terrible factions. <laughs> the other <laughs> <laughs> yes, but yeah, Legionnaires is, is right now has a lot of potential. It's a lot more uh, a funnier team to play, and you can do crazy stuff like the like the auto bolt rifles here. <laughs> yeah, the auto bolt rifle, four dudes with mobile, so they can four fall dudes. back for one and still double shoot. That's yeah. Jason's. That's where Jason's at. Obviously, yeah. Legionary don't get to do anything that wild, but. As me and Jason on the podcast have talked to other people who've played Legionary over the years, there are special tools that players like on the Legionary roster for specific matchups. Like, for example, Geller Pox have a pretty rough matchup when you toss in a couple Slanesh guys, because now you suddenly have yes. extra stun grenades that your opponent really can't manage. And if you're stunning <laughs> the Geller Pox Hulks, they really aren't doing anything. So running around, deleting dudes, then minus APLing on the Hulks while you shoot them down with your Nurgle guys is probably a strategy that might make sense. Or even having Corn mm -hmm. guys go in and just bopping all the small stuff while the yeah. while the Slanesh girls go and go to town. So it kind of depends. So what <laughs> how have you been interacting yeah. with the new roster and what matchups are you taking some of these new tools for that you probably couldn't have in the past? Yeah. If, uh, I, may, if I may before going kind of like yeah Something I really like because kind of like the reason that made me play demons in the first place was, you know, being able to play Slanesh because I kind of like like it in lore. And I was actually toying with Leonaris. I actually bought Leonaris mm -hmm. as, you know, as a team. But Slanesh in Leonaris had a lot of tools that made sense. A lot of elites against elites, like against uh, enemies that were injured. And casually, most of elites had ways to avoid being injured. So it kind of like didn't make much sense to have a Slanesh at all because, you know, um, Intercession can ignore that, Custodies can ignore that, Cinch Legionaries can ignore that. So yeah, it was not, it was extremely situational. But now that you have the rosters unlocked, you really, you know, can have the luxury to have these extremely situational pieces for very particular matchups and Get Our Box being one of them. Like, I think it was yeah. Shane that said it. You have this Shrift Talon with a Slanish that can go extremely fast, goes, and once it kills a little guy, it kind of, like, take one APL off the big ones. So, yeah, that can completely swing up a match entirely. Yes, yes, that's that's the point. Really, like Javier uh, said, uh, I I used to play Nargal and Slanish against uh, eight teams like Geller Box. I right now it works a lot uh, to play against uh, Felgo Ravagers using a wall of meat like Nargle in sort of operative and have a backup for the crits using corn. So you always you can always rely on that because 
you can send right now uh, uh, a very disgusting resilience team and have the, the crits you need to, to fight against them. Uh, in the normal mashup, you can go um, you can go Singe, like I told, uh, like I told before, uh, against seven or eight boons teams to uh, to abuse of the fa to little five. Well, that kind of little five to um, to to blast them to have a lot of alpha strikes. In in fact, uh, many 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 times uh, uh, before the these changes, uh, my my acolyte always always, uh, almost always, managed to do a terrible alpha strikes to, to my, for my opponent. Good for me, terrible for my <laughs> opponent. <laughs> I just, I, my, the bell fire uh, used to eliminate three or five guys in turn one sometimes. Dep depending on the map, right? Uh, uh, taking some bad position, but being an argot, so I have to crit for, I have to far, to, to re-roll, I'm trying to, to so just trying to trigger the blast, which is not consistent. Yeah. So even if you're yeah. hitting a couple people, I've watched some guys get away with like, oh, I did the blast and I only killed two dudes. And to me, no. that seems crazy. But with a Zinch Legionary, it's almost impossible for, you know, two or three guys to not trigger some splash damage, which basically chain reactions and yeah. murders a couple yeah. guys. So right now you, you, you have at least one more secure strike, alpha strike in your first turn. So... It's very, very strong. So you have Singe to destroy the little guys. You have a Slanish to fight against big guys like Galar Pox or things that cannot avoid the the the, the, the minus minus, one APL. Yeah. yeah, and you have Corn to this to obliterate uh, some some teams like who cannot who cannot. Defend against the horrible crits and the uh, I always I always forget perpetual aggression uh, where you can move from yes. model to model. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's oh, that's that's delicious. Yes, that's <laughs> some, that's amazing. All the gods have all the four gods have the the jump um, and you can all now you can use them all. That's the goal. So yeah, it's, I don't know if if I'm telling you everything, but I, I'm going to resume that. You can you can. It could yeah, be I if mean, I'm speaking there to there definitely is, There's like <laughs> Legionary is so interesting because there's so many things to talk about. Um, one question that I want to sneak in real quick is what is your favorite operative to Mark of Corn and like what's the build? My favorite is uh, the Demon Guy. Yeah. The, uh, yes. Uh, anointed. Anointed. The, no the Anointed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. The Anointed. Even, even some people talk about the butcher but no i, I prefer the anointed is sometimes well some mashups the anointed ha, have been able to kill two foes and be, uh, get connected to the third one so is is it's a guy who can obliterate uh three guys from one elite team so in the horror mashup is um, is amazing so no no it's terrible it's a beast Just it's my favorite operator for corn yeah <laughs> So Nurgle is your main chaos mark. Um, yeah. How often do like when you bring other stuff? Is it usually just one or two, or do you do like a three-three split? No, top three. Top, top sorry, two, two, two guys at top. Okay, so uh, I only choose two guys. Yeah, yeah, two for Nurgle, tops. two marks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two tops, because it's Nurgle is too consistent. It's, mm -hmm. it's, oh, sorry. Be, beside the lore, uh, the love, uh, my love for the lore of Nargal, uh, Nargal for me is the most consistent god of, of, of the four. The other three are very situational, have to need uh, too, many, too many key points uh, to work, but Nargal always works. Yeah, yeah and if you're right. taking Zinch, you actually can't really take Nurgle on the yeah. board. So you're basically running Corn or Slanesh with Zinch if you're going to do it. Yes. And at that point, if you were to do that, I don't. it sounded like earlier when you were talking about your roster, that's not an option as far as like, <laughs> no. how you guys are playing. But if yeah. you do take the Zinch Fire Blast, what are you working him into? Are you generally taking Slanesh or are you generally taking Corn in those situations? Uh, right now, I will play more Slanesh and Zinch. Because um, cor the current guys are very fun, 
with anointed. Mm -hmm. But when you face uh, good players or a certain level, um, the 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 aggression can you perpetual aggression you? is not perpetual as likely aggression. to go off because your opponent is yeah. making space ahead of time, or he's only forcing you to end up in an awkward spot when you perpetual perpetually aggress. Right, right, correct. That's correct. Corner is it's too much uh, telegraph. It's, it's too much uh, easy to prevent. But Slanish with the extra inch, uh, um, taking you APLs um, and Sange, um, uh, and Sange as securing that the crit, especially. I, I will take. Okay, if I have to tell a rooster. I will take a three three with with the Slanish and and Sench. The of course the Bellfire Acolyte, the other two gunners if it's the situation, and the other three guys of course I I sorry I always remember the the names in, in Spanish. But I'm going to say I think it would be the anoint uh, the anointed the Shrive yeah. Talon and then the champion would be generally the melee guys that go yes, in and then the right backline now. would be the normal gunner the heavy gunner and then the Bellfire. Yeah, that will be my my that will be my team. So the, the leader with you mentioned you the like with Nurgle. The mm -hmm. You like you mentioned you like Nurgle. When yeah. do you actually take this three three split of like Slanesh and Zeech? What matchup is it against Gellerpox, against Felgor, against Chaos Cults? I suspect not Chaos Cults because as far as me and Jason's no. weekly stat show <laughs> shows up is we, nobody we plays Chaos to. Cults. It's they're gone. <laughs> like there's three players in the whole world and like maybe one of them plays every other week. So basically no <laughs> one's playing them, unfortunately. Yeah. No, unfortunately, I, I, it kind of depends on how people feel about the Chaos Cultists. So when are you <laughs> playing those things? I will play. I have played against the, like horde teams because they are more easy to mark. The, there is more easy to get them because the extra uh, extra inch and the crits you can destroy a bet a bet a bet guard army going up and with your singe gunner and and blow up three or four bets and if he wants to attack you back with your plasma or something you can secure the the impulse. so it's it's a very it's a very good move but. And of course, I, uh, I did, sorry, did you tell me. No, I think that particular combination could also work against Mandrakes, and because yeah, stunning them actually can can hurt them sometimes. Yeah, a stun I, I, chooser is definitely going to run into some issues, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like any of those are models just... are going to have a really bad time if you stun them. Yeah. 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 It worked a lot. I in my last tournament, I use I well, I use Nemesis. And I, I, <laughs> and I uh, take one APL of one key operative, and the team. Okay, the team, the team stops. So it was, it wasn't a trade the whole turn. So yeah, it's a lot. It's Lanish in that point. Against every elf team, elder team, that combination is good, because Nargel lose efficiency against that kind of parties, because you cannot avoid the power weapon. You cannot reduce the damage of the power weapons. Uh, you cannot. Um, Defends well again the three damage of some weapons that Nemesis have. The sorry, the Mandrakes have yes uh, against Horde teams and and Elder teams. Uh, Slanish and and, and Sench is a good combination mm -hmm. against uh, Intercessor. I will I will go full Nargo just in case. <laughs> <laughs> just in case of the double shooting. Yeah, you gotta be careful. <laughs> yeah, I need to. I need to secure the crits against them. <laughs> Shit. Yeah, Legionnaire definitely in a very interesting spot. I think I'm really looking forward to Nova, which will happen. I think two weeks after this podcast comes out, because Nova is going to have uncapped rosters. So not only not only is it you know now Legionnaire can do whatever they want when they bring models out, but at Nova specifically, there will be no roster restrictions, so you can have. Wait, six level one game, six inch the next. Do you have any insight into how this would change a couple of your matchups? Like, what's rough right now with you being Nurgle as a big brick, and how do you think that would open up play space for you? I'm just curious. <sighs> and that's a tough, that's a tough question. <laughs> Sorry, I had Javier help me. <laughs> yeah, and, and you can start with like, what are some of the the toughest matchups for Legionary? Mm -hmm. Well, the, my, my tough mashups are the specific like teams like Corsairs. 
teams that have a lot of firepower and, and, and melee power, especially especially like power weapons, and things that can, if 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 reach you uh, and you cannot defend against the the melee grids, are uh, that's that's a more terrible matchup that I have that I have that I have in the past. I don't have to say it well, but yes, my my yeah, really. Really, I wasn't. I was checking my my research in the computer. So my my, I cannot say it. Mis antiguos matches. Your past rusters or your my past my past matches. Yes, mm-hmm. in and um, yes, the worst match I have against uh, against uh, corsairs, corsairs. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Um, the, the clowns, the flame yeah, because corsairs and voy and harlequins, like they really this. don't Harlequin. care too much about Nurgle, right? Because yeah. they have, yeah. you know, power swords and three damage guns. So when you're getting shot, you're always taking whatever their minimum break point is, anyway. So that doesn't matter. And not anymore. It used to be the other way around, and that matchup was almost it impossible. Was, for it was beautiful. Yeah. Now, now, however, that's been opened up. And if you're taking Nurgle, that means that you're kind of in a weird position where you now need to go looking through the rest of your roster. So if you only have a couple corn guys or a couple slash guys or a couple Zinch guys, you're restricted a little bit. So if you were able to take whatever you wanted with a roster, what would you change? Um, I would change. If I can, I, I can take everything. Mm-hmm. Everything, everything. I don't. Know. I, I will. <laughs> yeah, I will. Like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> is there any like one operative that you're like, oh man, I would bring this, but he just doesn't make the roster cut? If there's like, I don't know, like uh, the Slanesh uh, sorcerer. What's that guy's name? No, the Slanesh sorcerer, the Bell. The Bell fire. Yeah, the Bell fire. The Bell fire. No, no, no. <laughs> All the strikes. <laughs> Yeah, the king no, I, or queen of the alpha strikes, depending on how that balefire acolyte swings, I suppose. Yes, no, I, I, I will. I don't know one, one thing. I take some. One time, I take my butcher with this Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that was a crazy move, but uh, I didn't I use it in all the like, tournament. Yeah, but kind of like because this butcher has this two-inch engagement range thingy that you yeah. can, you know. Tying a lot of people in melee, especially if your opponent is not ready for that. It's kind of like a small missile that, you know, against an horde team that, I don't know, already used the comms. Then you already kind of like, you know, clock a lot of their backline just with the watcher and taking out the anything. Yeah, but uh, that's really a crazy operative. I, I always put it, uh, I always choose watcher with Eslanesh in some in my roosters with Eslanesh, but I didn't, I, I never use it. I don't know. In, if I can, if I I I can make, I don't say, um, un reclamo. I would say, yeah, no. um, hmm. a complaint. <laughs> a complaint about Nargel. Uh, uh, sorry, not about Nargel. About legionaries in is, but the butcher specifically is a bad operative. It's a good operative, but it's a bad operative in reality. He, so he, you, he you, exists to make your opponent annoyed, but when he go- yeah. swings his big butcher sword, big butcher axe, you're always. I think from everything that I've seen, the butcher attacking with his axe tends to be disappointed, mostly because yeah. it says four dice on four is relentless, which means that you get two to three hits, which is not what you want. Which uh-huh. is because it's not brutal or anything. And then when you get charged, you have to pull out a little baby knife to defend yourself because four yes. useless doesn't do anything. So you always have to take a malefic blade. So he's just eating this equipment points that you'd rather put on something else. So he yeah, ends up being terrible. a lot of babysitting. So it sounds like, you know, maybe there's not going to be anything too crazy with that. I am honestly not even sure if anyone's going to take Legionary just because everyone is interested in the new hotness for Night yeah. Lords. And it sounds like you've been dabbling in Night Lords also, which is good. But... But I believe I, 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 this is not a, a crazy, a crazy idea. But I believe uh, legionaries are stronger than nemesis. If you like, if you manage to survive the first or second turn with legionaries, and you go close, and uh, you go close the nemesis, you're going to eat them all. It's, legionaries is too much powerful. It's, a, it's too much stronger than than nemesis. Nemesis, I I, I like to play nemesis. Uh, right now I. <laughs> Sorry, I <laughs> you know how to say, it, but um, I I have a good um, narracha, no buena racha, how to say, and I have a 
Stretch. A good sprint with the Nemesis, but uh, I feel them like um, Chaos Phobos. Mm. <laughs> they are good. They're good. They, they have all the tools that Phobos should have at the start, but they give them to Nemesis. But I don't know. Legionnaires are They have new form. weaknesses for being as good as Nemesis Claw are, and maybe perhaps at the upper end of wherever Peru's metagame is, some people are starting to play around what the Night Lords can do, and it feels like you're getting limited a little bit. Because you're missing yeah. out, like, the corn insane melee guy yeah. that like, runs out and something like, ah, I've killed three operatives worth of stuff with one dude. Because ultimately, Night Lords do only do the, the two attacks, right? They're not getting more than two aggressive actions off in one play. I, although, I guess, skinning a dude alive and forcing someone to not score an objective <laughs> does feel like you're getting a little bit more than that's, just one operative's worth of work. That's a real butcher. <laughs> Legionnaires. <laughs> Should, should learn that. <laughs> we, we need an upgrade on the butcher. Uh, and I, I, I hope to the, if, I, I don't know, maybe in a couple of months, uh, Legionaries and other teams, especially elite teams, have that same buff, uh, also the same combination of skills, like uh, double fight and double shoot in the same, in the same command point. Like it does seem like we're moving in that direction between the Warp Coven and the Night Lords getting a version of everybody double fights and everybody double shoots. So who yeah. knows? I wouldn't be surprised if that ends up getting joined together. It would make the Undivided Mark a little bit better because if your yeah. Undivided Leader just gives everybody Oof. double fight and double shoot for a game, that does feel like it would open up a couple options. Yes, I, I used to play a lot. Uh, I use that mark sometimes in math matches. It works. It works. So, yeah, people say if you have untapped rosters. Right. It would bring them back on the menu too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right now that. Well, that's that. Almost all the the history about uh, my legionaries. I don't know if he's gonna have another question because the last question was already hard. Sorry, <laughs> I have it was. Big right now. If I haven't even decide if I want to go with Nemesis or legionaries or another uh, elite team to the wars in the case we manage, I haven't. So I oh, it's, it's still on yeah. the table, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That that question uh, shook my war. Really, I actually <laughs> it wasn't prepared. <laughs> you know, we do since we have our compendium demon, Chad. You know, you went to, you went to the world championships. You know, with with compendium demons, and interestingly enough, compendium demons have had somewhat of a resurgence. I feel like this year on the week to week stats, right, Jason? Yeah, they've been like consistently popping up and like doing weirdly well. Like demons, solid choice. Yeah, I've been kind of like following up with the discussions on demons. And, you know, we actually have seen a trend this past year, I think, with the LVO terrain, in which maps were really very, very tight, so to speak. Yeah. And those tight maps with a lot of heavy, having 12 power weapon wielding, you know, operatives with nine wounds is extremely strong. Especially if you're gonna, you know, also mix it up with uh, Slanish or even uh, Nargle, because right now uh, a lot of people are taking Nargle because you know having eight plague, uh, twelve plague bears uh, with feel no pain five plus and effective twelve wounds is it's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, for the WTC, the American team is using yeah. an all Nurgle Demons player to kind of backstop some of their hardest matchups. With the idea being, you know, it's a lot of wounds. If we just sit around and score points, it's going to be hard to lose by much more than, you know, three or yeah. four points, which is enough <laughs> if all your other teammates are doing it's well. Like, it's like, I'm doing my job. <laughs> my job <laughs> is to sit here and job. take the worst matchup. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Someone actually asked me, hey, did you go to the World Teams Championship? I was like, no, mate, it's not me. <laughs> It's not me. It's another one. I mean, <laughs> yeah. To be we, fair, we how have you been? How have you, like obviously, when we first talked to you, you were probably one of the first major people really pushing demons at any competitive level. I think, as far as we know. And then this year, we've seen it a lot more. One of our Patreon listeners, Matt, I know you're listening to this. I'm, he's been running demons for the better part of this year. He loves Compendium, and you know, there's a couple other teams in the Compendium that do slap, but demons have been one that Orion, you, and Matt have all been playing, you know, sprinkling about throughout the year, and they do have their strong points. So yeah. before we get into the Hunter Clay discussion, because you've been playing Hunter Clay a little bit more, you know, how have you felt listening to people talk about demons? And what do you think they're missing? Or do you think they found new things that you missed when you were before the worlds for you? No, I mean, it's it's been great because, you know, when you get into something, you kind of like want to always share like, hey, demons are cool because of this, because of that. And last year, we really didn't have much people to tinker about ideas, right? It was uh, basically me and just some other people that were just getting into the game. 
But now that a lot of more people are taking it to you know a high level, it's great to listen to their stories, to listen to their feedback and say, hey, this worked for me, this didn't work. And you know, having a community to actually you know think about with your team has has been great. Kind of like more of the discussion this year, I feel, has been geared towards Nargle, to the plague bears. Because in my, you know, my world run and in my last year analysis, I kind of like dissed on them a bit, didn't bring them. But too this slow, year, too, slow been... too much babying as far as action points. So you were on the Slanesh yeah. train, get in on those turn mm-hmm. one, four twos and really making your opponent sweat it out. Yeah. Uh, but people have been using this because, again, I think the maps have changed a bit. And in these maps, you know, having that extra dash doesn't really mean much. And so far, if you cannot make a 4-2 or, you know, a very comfortable turn one with the Slanesh, then you're better off, you know, having these effective 12 round operatives. So that has so far worked for him, for other people. And it's it's been great reading reading their stories. But you've not been playing demons all that much this year, I take it. No, I have retired them a bit. I use them mostly as, you know, to teach people the game because they are so simple and it's easy to get like, okay, these guys shoot and these guys fight. But yeah, kind of like last year I had a discussion with a friend from Spain. He said, hey, I, I, I like what you've done with demons. I'm going to take them for a spin. And after, you know, a month or so, he sent me an audio. And it was extremely detailed audio, in Spanish, of course, that said, okay, this team works here, works here, works here, but in these many situations, it doesn't. And kind of like the main point that was the argument against demons was the lack of um, an explosive opening in terms of, especially in terms of uh, turning point two. And he made a point that was very good. That is, when you compare this Horde versus other teams, or even, you know, mid-range teams, like, say, Elucidian and Soft Striders, or even Hunter Clade, Demons doesn't have the option to get a double kill. It just doesn't. The only kind of, like, blast weapon, torrent weapon you have is Norgul's heads, which are range 6, so <laughs> it's very hard to pull off. And mm-hmm. you are most likely not really... Um, doing a double kill whatsoever on these very specific cases. And in those scenarios, your turning point two opening is very, you know, milled, it's very soft, and you end up kind of like trading one for one for your enemy opponents. And if you got the numbers on your side, then that's great. But if not, then you can end up losing the match. And that kind of like got me thinking, uh, I was like, okay, it does make sense to where can I take the skills that I learned as a demon player to better use? And I was toying with both Blooded and Hunter Clade. And ultimately, kind of like a bit uh, opted up for Hunter Clade because I do believe that Rust Stalkers are excellent operatives in this meta. And yeah, I took them in for a spin. I bought them as well. And so far, so good. Been really enjoying the team. Yeah, Hunter Clade are one of the teams that me and Jason have been watching on the week-to-week stats because they do have the archetype of what has generally been good over the last couple months. With the loss of Felgor and some of these other big teams, yeah. it turns out that the mixed teams have been doing pretty well because the mixed teams have always kind of outdone the elites on some level just because you've got a couple AP2 guns and AP2 guns make, make Marines sweat because you really can't have them get hit too often. And then... Hunter Clade specifically get a whole bag of tricks. You know, when Imperial Navy Breachers were at the height of their power, everybody was complaining about GA2. Turns out Hunter Clade still have a version of it with their control edict yep. on the Skatari Alpha. And being able to flexibly choose between two Sicarians or two Skatari. And I know for AdMac players out there who or for non AdMac players, these all sound like made up words because they absolutely <laughs> are. But Skatari <laughs> are the seven wound small bases and Sicarians are the ten wound bases and control edict is the leader's ability which lets you flexibly ga to them as long as people are within three inches so a really good player on turn two is trying to look for where those best pieces are for you to ga to because not only do you have comms but you can also like almost triple comms on the opening of a turn two play if you've got enough stuff going on yeah kind of like they have they do seem like a, a fair team so to speak one team that's not doing anything you know esoteric or mystical in the sense that it's not, you know, teleporting around the map. It's not kind of like denying you activations or whatever. 
it's just a, a thing with shooters and melee guys, but they do have uh, some very kind of like unfair advantages, and mainly it is because of these uh, Rust Talkers, the Sicarians, and the Alpha Leader. Uh, the GA2, this you know, situational slash optional GA2 is amazing, and these Rust Talkers having the ability to fight twice and fight for free makes them effective 3 APL, which is insane on Into the Dark and also insane on loot. You can do things like charge, kill an orc because you have um, you're critting on you have 4-6 uh, rending weapon, which if you get land a crit, you're most likely to kill anything. Uh, even a legendary, <laughs> if you if you're lucky. And <laughs> you end up killing this tough operative and you either of, or fight again or loot. And that's really, really amazing. Having, you know, these four guys have effective 3 APL for whatever you need is, is extremely strong. And something that I kind of like learned, kind of like talking more with the Hunter Click community, was to respect the infiltrators. Most of the time, people have kind of like, you know, br bring it in for um, all Rust Stalkers or go with just one infiltrator to go to this forward deploy. But um, these infiltrators have this uh, ploy that deny enemy rerolls six inches around them in a, in a bubble. And this is extremely, extremely strong against uh, enemy hordes, like, for example, Pathfinders or um, or better Gutsman, since or even Wyrmblade, for example, since these teams have rather bad shooting but rely a lot on their rerolls, and you are constantly denying them, it's it kind of like you know paints paints them too much, uh, you know. Um, for example, Pathfinders have their bonded reroll; they have another reroll coming from somewhere, and if suddenly, yeah, from their mark lights and stuff. And if you suddenly kind of like turn that off completely, they're just, you know, shooting at fours, landing you one, two hits, and you can consistently block them with uh, with a four plus save, more so if you're in cover. So it really is uh, a powerful tool. Actually, some player in the name of Spin, what's the name? Spin away? Uh, actually was a bit more crazy than I am. And he recommends bringing up to four infiltrators for these matchups, for these hordes, right? Kind of like, it's like, okay, I don't care about, you know, not being able to fight twice. I just bring, <laughs> I just bring this and deny rerolls all on the map. And mm. okay, good luck. Yeah, and, actually, uh, one of the matchups where I conceive that this might be good is against Mandrakes. Having yeah, a couple yeah. extra no reroll bubbles means that the Mandrakes are playing much more fair. And I think... As anyone who's played Corsair Void's Car would know, the hardest part about that team is you have no raw rerolls. And not having rerolls means that four attacks hitting on threes is generally about like two to three attacks. You're generally not going to hit four. And losing rerolls when your opponent's got Flechette Blasters, which will just delete and injure a Mandrake, or a Power Sword while you're not rerolling anything, can be very rough, especially on a 10 wound model. Yeah. And they have been a, a good surprise. I'm currently kind of like running two. Two of them. And, well, finally, uh, something that I have also been been toying about is there is also this discussion of whether or not it's 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 actually worth to bring up Rangers or not. Um, to explain this, Skitari come in two flavors. And they have the Vanguards that have this two-inch uh, aura that makes enemies injured, which is extremely good. It actually increases their survivability a lot. Like, I had... Um, I had once an enemy locus from a Wyrmblade uh, from a Wyrmblade team try to kill a basic guy of <laughs> of the shock trooper from from the vanguard, and he had no rerolls and he was injured, and he was suddenly you know not able to kill him. He was kind of like just getting two hits in, one hit in, and okay, like your powerful operative actually is is now is now kind of like rendered a bit useless. But yeah. Most of the time, it's the correct choice to bring uh, vanguards. But if you bring rangers, you have the extra benefit of a ploy called uh, pursuers. And what pursuers does is that it gives you two extra options of um, of the recon strategy that you pick, be that uh, your recon dash or be that your uh, infiltrate option. So on a particular match, you can actually have three guys flipping orders on turn one. And two of them are usually your gunners. 
which is huge. Uh, here in Peru, for example, one particular popular map is Chalnet, uh, more so than Octarius, more so than anything. Uh, we just happen to have a lot of Chalnet maps. And on, on yeah. those maps in which there's a lot of obscuring, there is a lot of you know heavy terrain through which you can look at, uh, having this triple infiltrate option puts a lot of pressure on your opponent. And yeah, also having three dashes on into the dark is very, very powerful because you can suddenly now kind of like reach doors and have a much larger threat range that you will only have if you actually, you know, use your, your comms on a gunner. But now you can use the comms on, I don't know, the leader or someone else while still having your gunners have this pregame dash that now brings them into threat range of many objective markers. So that's particularly, particularly cool. Yeah, plus like starting their activation while they're already within an inch of a door means they can open it and still shoot or like open it and still charge or open it and <laughs> do whatever they want. Yeah. And that's huge. You that's want. a big deal. Yeah. One particular trick I kind of like liked was having a ranger comms. So the comms mm. will dash and be near a door while I also dash, for example, I don't know, a, a rust sucker and have the, have the comms Open the door, pass an APL to the Rust Stalker, GA2, the Rust Stalker move dashes, opens the door because I gave him free mission action through server school and then fights twice on the other side of the door. <laughs> that has yeah. worked for me once, but still, it was cool to pull off. Yeah, I think one big thing to remember for anyone who has access to functionally a 4 APL model is that in the dark, you can clear a door and suddenly... Be, ha, look at your opponent's drop zone, which can be very scary. And Hunter Clay are one of the few teams that can actually prep that because you have the Servo Skull, which is a free mission action as an equipment. So you could you could definitely do something like that. Obviously, Legionary get to do this with Zinch Balefire yeah. Blast. So on yeah. in the dark, you do need to watch out for someone having a door open for them and a Balefire move dashing across the room and then Balefire your and it. It, it, it worked me. It, it worked me. It worked for me once in a in a casual game, but but yeah, it's amazing. Before before this this unleash roster, but yeah, it's good. Have four EPLs in Into the Dark is is good. For yeah, me. you can do terrible things. It's a lot, and well, if for any reason you know they were to open up rosters, I think also uh, Hunter Clade will will benefit uh, mostly. I think there is merit on some maps to bring the, the Infiltrator Princeps, the leader version of the Infiltrators. It actually has a free mission action natively built in. And you have that, and you have uh, the Servo School equipment, and you're suddenly running around with effective two effective 3 APL guys, throwing your Rust Stalkers, and, well, you're suddenly kind of like having a lot more APL, effective APL than, than your opponent at any given time. And plus, the leader can actually benefit itself from um, from an equipment that gives them um, invulnerable safe. It makes them 4++, four, 4++ four plus plus, four plus invulnerable safe. And try to take a 4++ plus plus invulnerable model with <laughs> 11 wounds. <laughs> tough. And yeah, I think that <laughs> being having rosters open will will allow us to tinker more with the leader options that are not currently being seen. Yeah. You know, making me making me want to take Hunter Clay, because I have them and I really like playing them. And I've been thinking they're sure, good. They're and good. you know, Nova's coming up. They do have uncapped rosters, so they are one of those teams that I've been I've been kind of thinking about. You can yeah, do you play them a while ago. I, I mean, that's how I got to the first world championships was with, back when Hunter Clay were at their at the height of them being broken. But at this point, you know, they've been nerfed, but they haven't been nerfed that much. And they no. did receive the nice cleanup of their reroll rules. So the rerolls just happen at all times now. So they are yeah. not an unfair team, but they're an unfair team in the sense they don't have to put a lot of work into doing the thing. Whereas when you look at Pathfinders of Vetguard on these Horde teams... They are unfair, but that's because they have a ton of rerolls because they hit on fours. And then you look at Legionary, and they're unfair because they have three action points, but they only got six models. Hunter Clay yeah. kind of get the best of both worlds, but they're bifurcated <laughs> along more range and more shooty. Yeah. Or, yeah, more melee and more shooty. Luckily, there are some neat little tricks that you can do in the Elites versus Elites matchup where you chuck in an injury bubble with your big melee monster, and suddenly your opponent's. <laughs> 
who's not expecting to be injured in the middle of a fight is now hitting on fours, and that really can mess people up. Yeah. Yep. And I think it's a team that benefits the most from grasping a good fundamental of the game, which I would say I think Demons kind of like gave me, in the sense that because Demons were really a simple team, you kind of like, you had to be careful not more about the rules load and things, but mostly be Try to play a, a good a good game in terms of okay, I need to position my guys this way, I need to clo- not clog them. Be there where I can threaten, you know, be most impactful for the next turn and that kind of stuff. And I think Hunter Clit rewards that, but has the option to, you know, be more explosive if you actually can land some stuff. Like for example, in in one of the games in which I won the my ticket, kind of like I was able to in turn two as my opening move. I had my leader with plus one APL. It had the mm-hmm. servo school, and it basically raced up the map with plus one movement and blasted a veteran gutsman, taking out three operatives like the sniper, uh, gunner, or someone else. And it was like you know a very strong move, even though it's a one inch blast. It was still able to you know threaten and decimate an enemy army. So yeah, that, <laughs> was, that was great. That was great. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Hunter Clade, that's... Hunter Clade GA2 with all of their toys can be very, very scary. Especially, you know, I think one of the big flex plays that we talked about in the past is being able to hit a control edict where you send two of your Sicarians with big swords down on both flanks with plus one movement, and yeah. one of them's back loaded, fight. the other one has servo skull. Suddenly, your opponent is now dealing with two, three APL models with double fight, and your opponent's just it's it can be rough. Yeah can be rough and you can entirely decimate one flank with if you if your opponent's not careful and sometimes because well this team is no longer as popular as it once was sometimes people don't know (laughs) or forget and yeah i think i think you mentioned that vanguard are pretty popular for you for anyone who doesn't know those are the guys with the helmets and they have rending guns and they have an injury bubble and then the rangers get a 3-4 p1 gun so I think one of the other things that we used to call out when people would come in and talk about them is that the Auspex can wield the Galv rifle as kind of like an extra shooting operative in the back line because you can give no cover, no obscurity to yourself, hitting on threes, generally with at least one reroll, and you've got three, four, P1, and suddenly your opponent is getting shot at and getting p one <laughs> without realizing it from this guy in the back. Yeah. And I think the giving it to the comms works best. Uh, most likely the comms is just, you know, passing APL. So you can pass APL and shoot if it's possible. And if you have, you're lucky, you get a P1 shot and whoop, they were not ready for that. And well, there goes your opponent, there goes your, uh, your high value operative. Yeah, so obviously it's been a while since we managed to talk to you guys. You know, Peru's, I assume, has been going through some growing. You know, last year, you guys had two players, three players? We, two players. It's just you two, right? Three yes. Tickets, but only two players were able to make it. Yeah. Really could, could make it, yeah. So this year, how many players are you, how many tickets did you guys get awarded? And how many players do you, are you guys hoping to send? Four and four, we hope. <laughs> <laughs> Ideally, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, do you guys want to tell us a little, tell the global listener base on some level, you know, what's been going on in Peru in the last year since the world championships and our last time talking to you guys? Because, you know, it's been a while and I'm, I'm curious what's been going on. You know, how are your local scenes? How's the local player base? And, uh, yeah. Again, I think the, the hardest part for the hobby has been, uh, getting support from local game stores because, um, Kind of like when you think of Kill Team as, you know, in a business perspective, Kill Team kind of like, you know, you buy yourself one team and you're good to go. So, you know, people don't really have the need to continue buying stuff from you Um, in the sense, like, for example, trading card games does, right? Every time there's a new magic set, everyone goes to the pre-release, everyone updates their decks, etc., it sometimes can be hard for you as a player, kind of like, I don't know, when one set of Magic released, I needed kind of like $300 to update my deck, and I was <laughs> like, no way. And, and yeah, but for the stores, I think it doesn't kind of like make much sense to run or are not more, many interested in growing uh, war, skirmish war game communities. 
But however, the player base in our country is very active and we have been running some, um, you know, uh, fun events, some sort of spec community driven events. And we created one circuit, which we called the Peruvian Competitive Circuit. And we found out yep. uh, a system to make tournaments work in a regular basis by yep. makes, make, basically making them a bit smaller and three rounds. Since yeah, smaller and faster. Yeah, and, since... and, the days, and the dates were like mm-hmm. two per month, two tournaments per month. Oh, mm-hmm. nice. Yeah. yeah. I think this allowed us to, you know, keep uh, a good pace because back in the last year, the norm was uh, four-round tournaments, which they are great. I do love them. But <laughs> just only, you know, taking out your whole day to run a Kinti Kilti Morgan uh, tournament in between, you know, it's basically one one hour and a half per round and you give one hour for lunch break and stuff. And yeah, you're mostly aiming to return home around, you know, like 5 p.m. or something if you start at 9. Yeah, 6 p.m. Like sometimes, that. yeah. But with a three-hour tournament, we just kind of like have faster events, and we start at nine. We end up, we end, we end up at two p.m. Go meet and <laughs> have lunch with our families, and they are not yeah, as angry as us. People are happier. Yeah, they yeah, are not I'm... as angry as us for, <laughs> for taking <laughs> time off to you know play our little war games because because the power base. I don't know how how old is the the player base in our countries back. Here is around thirteen plus years. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we I think have... that's generally about the age range. It feels like locally is everybody who played when we were kids or was really interested in forty k. COVID swung around, kill team was new, and then suddenly it's around like the thirty plus around the thirty ish range. It feels like so I'm not surprised. And obviously in our range, some people have kids, some people don't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're yeah, doing yeah. things. So, you know, having families is important. Significant others. So having a schedule that makes sense with your significant others and is supported by your significant others is obviously very useful. Yeah, Indeed. yeah. That's why we have. Uh, we always we only have one day at the at the the week. It's what's what's the name? Well, nah. Yeah, what's, what's the name? Yeah. Uh, simple. That word is hard. <laughs> but yeah, um, we 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 gather on the store, the main store where we all play kill team. At least in Lima, in, mm-hmm. in Lima, Peru. Yep. Um, we play like seven eight tables. It's like a small tournament. By the, by the with casual, yeah, yeah yes. really we have a lot of, of of active players in our circuits. Uh, we managed to make six to seven tables uh, because the top base is fourteen players to three rounds. So um, our tournaments are twelve to fourteen people with a uh, backup with 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 backup people in case any someone mm-hmm. couldn't yes. make it in the same day. That's good because. Um, the community is active. Uh, the stores, there are not many stores, like Javier said, because it's hard, no? We have to, I don't know, we have to, uh, it's a symbiotic relationship because, be, between Kill Team and 40k in the big scale because the, the, the big whales are the 40k players. They buy everything. But the Kill Team players, they used to run just one to two teams and that. Well, that's all. <laughs> I mean, not when you're playing stuff like Hunter Clade or Damon's, you know, you need to have three, four yeah. boxes. You got to have Warp Coven. It's kind of like that. So it kind of depends on the team. But obviously, it's never going to be as much as like someone buying a 2,000 point army. So the the kill team community makes up for it in different ways and having a more active player base, perhaps, or just having more players come in and out because it, the buy-in is a little bit easier. And one of the important yeah. things about growing community is making sure that you're being very welcoming to new players because those are the guys you never know who's going to show up and be like, actually, I want to buy like three or four teams and then they get yeah. to play a whole bunch more. Uh, so it's really uh, important lot, for those stores. A lot of TCG players, especially Magic the Gathering, all our hobby that we have with Javier in common, mm-hmm. that we're sharing with Javier, uh, a lot of, of, of friends have come to Kill Team because uh, the prices they are <laughs> you don't have to spend like a you know almost buy a car to play this game so they are they are, <laughs> they see the price and say oh my god i want to sell just one car um, and buy three kill teams please <laughs> and that's good and funny and healthy because <laughs> we make people to save money and have fun <laughs> Yeah, no joke. I kind of yeah. like sold one uh, MTG deck to finance my trip to Atlanta last year. So <laughs> yeah. that's how prices are in, in terms of TCGs. <laughs> and for, you know, 
for several countries which the exchange range <laughs> to dollar is is high it's it actually you know makes a lot of difference like if you tell a guy like hey i have this really crazy game that's called magic and there's this format called modern and it's really amazing good gameplay it's like okay but you need to you know drop uh three thousand dollars to get a functional deck that actually works they kind of like look just like oh maybe not but i don't know if you tell them hey you need to drop uh, 50 bucks to get yourself i don't know a Falco Ravagers team that a single box gives you everything you actually need to, you know, run a game and, you know, have a top tier performing faction. Speaking of the that last data slate, so to speak, it's it actually makes a world of a difference and makes them more, a more, you know, when they want to try the game out more. And it's really, it's really amazing uh, that Kill Team as a game has this lower barrier of entry. And we really hope yeah. that this actually continues up in you know next growing, next growing, years yeah. and uh, next editions as well yeah this this month we 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 got three new three new players mm-hmm. in general uh, almost four because yeah almost four one is going to the weekly session but only to learn he mm-hmm. haven't bought anything yet but it's growing it's growing and and i want to uh, to say again about if you I, I want to say this because one friend was talking about this earlier. Peru is um, is is the meta in Peru is very is very funny. We have a mixture of, of players between mid range, horde, and elite. But uh, the <laughs> the main players uh, who are dominating the the scene besides Javier are elite players right now. Elite uh, elite the the elite teams in Peru are very are very strong. We have a uh, a guy with custodies who won like three tournaments in a row. Uh, oh no, th- he he make it and second place three yeah. times in a row with custodies with four four guys only four, four guys with. Spirit. Oh, he's <laughs> not even doing. He's not even doing the two five. He's just stancing yeah, himself yeah. out there with shields, shields in. <laughs> yeah. Like an absolute madman, and he actually went yeah, to the. Yeah. <laughs> we can. He was very high, uh, highly ranked as the as the best custodies player once, I think. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, once, once he was the first. Yeah, yeah. And it was Ten Santos, so a shout out to him. Yes, and and then a lot of players are playing Nemesis, Phobos, and uh, Intercession. Our 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 Peruvian champion is an Intercession player. Yeah, the first play. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, now that we're on the topic, what? How did he do it? What did he do? Was he using something a little bit more standard with like durable and rapid, or what? What chapter taxes? You know, tell us a little bit. Yeah. About this intercession player from Peru that we have. Yeah, talked of course, about. of course. He he went the classic formation, uh, three three, three melee guys, three gunners. Uh, he changed sometimes between he plasma leader and the ball rifle leader. That was uh, the key point, because because it's a this is a big the big point in this tournament. He faced like two or three nemesis club players <laughs> in the tournament. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The first or two the two round were against nemesis player. And and he used his plasma leader, I believe, his gunner with little five and the blessed ball. No, um, one guy with little five and blessed ball, and the other guy with the regular gunner, another ball gun, ball gun, ball, ball gun guy with P1, and the other three were the the warriors to go melee against him because of the skewering. Uh, well, uh, I I didn't uh, follow all his matches because I was playing again so the mm-hmm. other guys, but but his composition were like that, almost three three. Uh, he faced like two or three Nemesis Claw, and his last matchup was against Bedgar in ETD in Into the Dark, and mm-hmm. and he obliterated the guy mm-hmm. <laughs> for for the for the sake of the other player. The intercession guy was eliminated the day he won all the initiatives, have amazing <laughs> yeah. roles. Yeah, <laughs> it does help. It does help. It does yeah, help. that's helped a lot. Because of level deep into the dark, yeah. the yeah, meta was, as we call it here, we are in the initiative meta. So. Yeah, we are in the initiative meta. <laughs> initiative meta, and the the initiative meta and the activation meta. <laughs> but yeah. but there is some initiative elites. So one tier is falling down. <laughs> it's very fair for any. Yeah. Did you ever get a chance to run the Doom Bolter strat that Jason floated by you last time you were on here? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's what where the, you put the sergeant gets you, all the equipment. You give him the yeah. blessed bolts and the scope, and he's hitting on twos. He's lethal five. It's four or five yeah. damage. You give him the aspects so he can ignore obscuring <laughs> and just like nail people with crazy angles. Uh, to be yeah. fair, I think Julio kind of like dropped intercession afterwards. Mm. Kind of like didn't get to play them more. Uh, I think, well, in his opinion, it says like a lot of people were bitching that it wasn't fair. <laughs> I was yeah. Like, well, they can bitch about this thing, but well, people were. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I use everything we talk the la- we, in our last uh, podcast, mm-hmm. I use it in my last tournament as intercession. And it was, it was horrible. Because you you avoid obscuring, you kill something. <laughs> it's, it's it was amazing. I didn't I didn't I didn't I didn't think about it in wars because they put the obscuring weapon in uh, and a melee guy always to. But it was a too a, a too much slow play. But when I changed it to the gunner or the or the leader, it was terrible. And people start to to, to realize that was a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, thank you a lot for you. I I. I I get the second place uh, in in the, in my last round with the extension session <laughs> because of that. <laughs> it was amazing. And into the dark, I kill. I remember I uh, the guy opened the door. He he, he thought he was completely obscuring, and I kill like four corsairs with my gunner wow. <laughs> because of a little five. The gunner with a frag two five. Mm. I get three crits in, in almost every shot. Because they had rerolls, <laughs> I killed four guys, and well, that's amazing. Yeah, thank you for that. The intercession is a good team, but I need a bit about intercession in favor of intercession. Intercession, I need. Uh, I believe they need a little more flavor of the other chapters, yeah. um, and that will be all. Just more flavor to to feel it different. But they are a good team. They are a good. They are not a. They are a good team. I, I I really I always I always, I always I will have my heart with them. Yeah. <laughs> really. I, yeah it can be, be very cool for for them to re-release intercession with actual chapters. So instead of getting to free choice, you just are given like oh you get two and a half chapter tactics, but you are now an imperial fist. So you don't get to choose. Yeah. But now you have a yeah, play style nice. dictated, and that would that could give them a little bit more power budget because you're like this skew will play this way. So maybe you have the best of both worlds. That could be a way that I could see putting a little bit more flavor and giving a little bit more room. Similar to how, you know, Legionary and it just like uncapped. It's, yes. You know, you fly, you fly in the Thunderhawk to your position, but you're not going to fight each other until you guys get outside. Yes. Uh, I, I believe right now is the best moment to do something like that, waiting for season three, because we, 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 are, we are at the door of the launch of the Space, Space Marine 2. And, and dude, they, they, they literally they told us people. we're going to have a, a kill team, a kill team, <laughs> a new kill team, like a Justian kill team on the PC game. So, or the place on the game. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Indeed. So, we have, we can have a, a river, a heavy boulder, like the Justians. That, that will, that will give a lot of flavor to the team. Maybe we can have a plasma, heavy boulder, um, uh, a okay, lieutenant yeah. they, they, with they just sword. doesn't need a plasma, but <laughs> I get where you're going. <laughs> I like where your head's at. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I love Marines, really. Chaos of, of loyalists. Uh, I, don't, <laughs> I really like them. So it sounds like Peru's been getting a little bit bigger and stabilizing. So you guys have a pretty regular scene. You guys are meeting up every week, which sounds really cool. And you guys are playing an hour and a half rounds, which is definitely on the shorter end. So for the guys who are going to the World Championships, how are you two preparing everybody else for the four-hour rounds at Worlds? <laughs> yeah, actually, time is it's kind of like a hot topic, I think, in many communities, from what I'm seeing online. Kind of like, we have adopted the use of uh, chess clocks. Mm. So you are required to use uh, chess clocks, and we give kind of like 45 minutes to each player. There are some who believe this is too little, and uh, but in general, I think the community has adopted to this. People who are kind of like you know, um, more on defense, kind of like have adjusted a bit, and it's basically now the the fact that this is a skill, right? So you may be the best. It's kind of like like chess, right? You can have a classical match of you know, <laughs> endless time of that that takes kind of like days long. But it's also a different skill to be able to, you know, 
do good moves in a you know shorter amount of time or a respectable amount of time. And the time limit has been implemented mainly because you know you need as a tournament organizer you need to have a fixed time in which your round actually ends or not. The tournament gets derailed a lot. And yeah, I think the community is currently has currently adapted to this time frame. So when you know you think about four hour rounds in worlds, it's like okay, well, if I can do it, you know, in less time, then right? in four hours I will I could you know take more time to think more and maybe do a bit better, right? Yeah, because our our, our matches in Peru are very are very short. We only played like forty minutes per player. Mm-hmm. They're very, they're very fast. Yeah, actually, um, I, love I, that. I know that huh? at the World Championships, a couple of players were like, "I'm not ready for having games take this long," and letting your opponent analyze everything down to the last detail because that is yeah. going to be a big thing at the at Worlds. You get to play, for, especially for Kill Team, because you know, for all the other big games, they go from three hour rounds in most U.S. tournaments. I'm sure, kind of like two and a half to three and a half rounds for most of the big army games and they're moving over to four so they actually get more time and kill team we're moving i think generally the standard is two ish hours and we're moving yeah. double the amount of time so yeah the preciseness of your lines matters a lot more or you know you just know what's good and you make your opponent deal with it and you watch them struggle so it kind of depends yeah. i believe i believe um well we weren't prepared to that i don't know how to say it. we weren't prepared to that but not in a in a wrong way because I believe the matches, I believe the experience of the wars. Um, I don't know how to say it. Uh, experience of the war uh, compensate the the long hour matches because we we had the opportunity to face a, such a good players because we well I, I face Orion uh, Ace for just some few names. Javier play against uh, Java, another another similar guys, uh, even Ace, even Ace mm-hmm. also, and the other guys, um, the fellow fellow Latin American players or American players that were very good. Uh, Dawson, who I, I play against Dawson, who also defeat Ace, uh, that compensates the long hours because you have a very nice experience of about learning, uh, uh, studying strategics because they play. Such long games <laughs> that they ha- they even explain to you what they were doing <laughs> in a matter of way. Yeah. They, they <laughs> and you, uh, we, I, I believe both of us learn a lot of the experience and, and help us a lot. Now we are playing short games because we are, um, I believe, are, are more confident, and more, more, more relaxed you know, in our ways to play, to explore new strategies, uh, like like intercessor with. With uh, <laughs> illuminating, scaring, yeah. and killing people in in the first turn, <laughs> yeah, it was good. But I, I, I would, I would want to to they short it a little bit, maximum two and a half hour, because we lost the opportunity also to to make a little tourist. Yep, we lost too much of the day. That was the main problem. Also, we have yeah, some good. But, work. And kind of like a full say, it's kind of like different, you know, when you take a lot of time because your opponent is new, he's new to its rules and stuff, or whether you're playing, you know, a highly rated opponent that's, you know, actually walking through, having a decent conversation and stuff, you, you have a good time. So the four hours may be long, but they do do pass fast at the end. Yeah, I mean, I've had a ton of my games, like at LVO and Adepticon and like everywhere I've gone, like a lot of my games, I mean, I was playing... Phobos and playing intercession, but most of those games were like forty minutes to an hour. So I'm like, Jason's I'm a just huge casually fan of cruising that. by in the middle of a round at LVO. Like, oh, I finished like ten minutes ago. I was like, what are you doing, Jason? Yeah, like <laughs> a bunch of people I chatted with were like, elite players. Elite players do 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 that. Yeah. When you when you have a game like six units versus six units, like, hey, I'm finishing twenty minutes. I was like, what? Oh yeah, or elite, player, like, elite player is the best. And then even if it's like <laughs> six models versus like a horde, if you just like dangle targets, and then they're like, "Oh yeah, well obviously I'm going to take that shot," and it's like, you know what you need to do, I know what I need to do, um, <laughs> and then you just rip through it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I love to play elite games. They are, they are, I yeah, they're amazing. Thankfully, Nemesis Close continues being popular, and yeah, world game are going to going to be <laughs> faster in a way. Yeah, yeah, and and guys, I want I want to ask you: 
uh, yeah, that uh, that you know that in Peru the meta are top elites or uh, mainly elites. How do you see elite teams in in worldwide? I think uh, the group uh, honestly, is kind of hot, right? yeah. Honestly, I would expect that it is rough for elites, but I feel like most players developmentally are at the point where they think that elites are easy enough to beat where most people have kind of squirreled away how to beat them and depending on the maps elites can still be kind of dangerous so like on in the dark elites have always been a little bit better just because you can make it relatively safe through the first turn and really make sure that second turn hits really hard and on you know boards like the lvo boards where you have or at least at the time where you could have pretty dense pretty out of visibility positions for your elites they were still okay in those situations obviously not as good as they are in, in the dark so yeah, it might be fine but you do need to play on the elite side you need to play very well and you have way less slack than your opponents do when you're playing something like blooded that has a lot of lethality or just teams with a couple ap2 guns like casserkin for as bad as they are as far as win rate goes casserkin still eat elites for lunch because you have three ap2 guns and that's just not a thing that can stand, but because Kaskar never really took off, you know, elites do hunt some of these top end teams okay. You, know, you were mentioning elites are pretty solid against elves. That's probably relatively true. Hernkin Jaeger, maybe to some extent you can pick on them a little bit just because you have more stats than they do. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Jason, how do you feel about elites right now on the global meta, especially with our week to week stature that we host on Patreon every week? I mean, uh, <laughs> they are kind of swingy. They're kind of on the lower end. And I feel like people in general don't really have a whole lot of faith in them once you get up to like anything above 16 players. I think elites are really, really going to struggle like there's they're going to run into some high end players on some matchups that are really, really tough. Um, honestly, I feel like personally. If I practiced more, I could like be a perfectly fine contender in a lot of those matchups. That's how I felt like at LVO and Adepticon and everything. Like the matchups, like I, I lost, you know, I I only lost like two out of nine games, and um, you know, that was kind of like the vibe. At LVO, and you know, the matches there were Tyranids, which is almost unwinnable because Gene Stiller's just there's too many of them. <laughs> you yeah. don't want just, you don't want to do that like, with intercessors. It's just not fun. And then Felgor, who were at the time were at the peak, or like the second peak. They're low, slightly lower from the release, and they were all basically also impossible for elites, just because yeah. you just get more. <sighs> and I had never done that matchup, but like some people thought that it was like intercessors could kind of hang in that. And I think if I like did it a few times and like practice and knew what I was doing, that that one could have been a totally fine game. And then actually, in that case, I probably would have dodged the Tyranids, and then who knows what's <laughs> after that. And like you know, there's there's nothing really that seems that scary for the way that I play any of the, the elites. And I feel like they are a strong contender. Um, and I, I, I wish I could go to more big tournaments to, to keep on getting more uh, interesting results. But they just, I mean, they, they always just seem really strong and really cool. And I think they're totally valid. Thank you. Also the wall aggro. Jason's out here giving up his back home objectives and just taking his opponents, so... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and and you do believe we are going to get uh, jam pack intercessors for season? You know that would be <laughs> super sick. Honestly, like one of the one of my wish list teams, and I've mentioned this a couple times before. Uh, if you really dig for, um, but I wanted there to be uh, a Night Lords kill team that would just be like five Raptors, and it's just like five jump pack Marines. They have normal movement, yeah. but they fly and they have like chain swords, and you can take a melt a gun. I was like, that would be a super cool team. Um, yeah. so then like assault intercessors kind of like the same vibe. I mean, like there's, there's plenty of space Marines there that like, if, if we did get a, a refresh, we could have hell blasters, we could have assault intercessors, and then there could yeah. be factors to balance them out. Desolators. We have a, a bunch of, of terrible things in our, in our armory for intercessors, for space Marines in general. Plus yeah. for all the stores out there, it gives the players more reasons to buy more models. So there's yeah. <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> it's amazing. That was my question. Thank you guys for my question. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and then while we were talking about Legionary, I wanted to plug one operative, or I guess two. Um, there's two of my favorite Legionary uh, configurations to noodle around with. One of them mm -hmm. is the Corn Chosen. 
because he has that four seven demon blade. Yeah. And then you can give him plus one damage so that it's eight damage. And then it's with five attacks on two and you have a guaranteed crit because you're corn. He swings for eight mm-hmm. damage, one shot kills anything that is an eight wound model and heals two damage. <laughs> Yeah. Plus, he can yeah, chain lightning cool. charge into someone else. So that one operative can easily kill like four or five enemies. And he is like the new Doom guy. Especially, you might as well go all in and like give him the <laughs> give him the trophy rack, so like people get minus attacks against him, and then like you know whatever else you want to do. And then he can just full blown menace his way through everything and be an unstoppable, horrifying monster that will just butcher everybody. Uh, pretty amazing. <laughs> Um, and you can you can couple that with the um, the savage butcher uh, tack up where if he kills three enemies in melee you max it out very very yeah, very easy very to do simple. yeah that's a fu- that's a such a funny tack up yeah um, the other one I do like the butcher as corn for the same reason where if any of your four dice re rolling is a single hit um, it is immediately becomes a crit and that can do eight damage if you've got the bonus damage. Um, yeah. Plus, if you run him into a horde and the crit gives you guaranteed reap, you run up and yeah. you chop someone and you do reap damage to everyone around you. You fight again, you one hit kills someone else and you do reap damage to everyone around you. And then, like, if you bomb him into a horde, he can kill like four people. And then, like, if someone yeah. else does fight back and kill him, he'll fight on death and <laughs> kill one more person on the way out and reap again. Yeah. I wish I wish another change in that. I wish to they give a uh, rip a rework. Yeah. To be more efficient. Agreed. Like blast or splash, but more, more, more. Oh, you slide out there just at the edges of fringe usability only around get down Mr. Preston variants. So well there's a couple yeah. things that hopefully when they if they do make a change, because we really don't know when changes are coming down, you know, that we can make all the rules useful. Or if the rules aren't useful, just freaking get rid of them and give us something yeah. different and yeah use fusillate only once and it's <sighs> worth yeah against <laughs> felgo ravagers with uh, lucidian star striders with the rotor cannon i kind of like shot three dice against a frenzied goat fishing for my crit and i found it <laughs> and i used the other three to you know kill off a, a wounded <laughs> a wounded goat sending it to frenzy yeah, It'd I've work. only seen Fusillade pretty pretty usable on six attack weapons, so it's basically reserved for exactly Warp Coven, the Relentless yeah. Rotor Cannon on Star Striders, and I think it's on the the Chain Gun? Is it on the Chain Gun? Yeah, the, 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 the check, I never use Chain Gun. I just, I, I, a lot of people like it, but yeah, you have Fusillade. Honestly, I don't think I, anybody I, likes it. It's just a literal raw numbers thing. When, when you look at the damage calculator, the Reaper Chain Cannon theoretically does the most. But then it loses yeah. out on the option of blast, and losing that option does hurt, and it loses double shoot. So I think a lot yeah. of people are kind of addicted to double shooting, and a lot of people like the threat of one more blast profile. So you know. yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I know that. Like I get them. <laughs> yes, I, I'm addicted to Volta Volta Discipline. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, the fusillade keyword should just be Bolter Discipline. Like, just like make fusillade. Uh, if you have this keyword, you can shoot twice and then sprinkle it. Wherever you want it. Yeah, that really yeah, cool. that's that would be amazing. And, and, it, and to be fair, the second shoot c- could be a ballistic worse on like four up, I don't know, to be, to make it fair because it will be 12, da- 12 dices. So the first round can kill and the second round can kill again, but like uh, the machine gun is reliability. Ready. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. something. But that's, that's a good idea, really. Fusillate will become like Volta Display. That's, that's how it works in that Dark Tide game that they launched. The really? fusillade keyword, yeah. and it just means this character can shoot twice. Yeah, nice. that's. I hope that will be uh, like a foreshadowing something. To Hopefully, this <laughs> three. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, you know, Julio Sawyer, thank you for coming on to the <laughs> podcast again. It's super interesting hearing about Peru's, you know, hour and a half speed scene while you guys are prepping to go to the World Championships. Hopefully, I'll see you guys there. I might be there uh, in a similar capacity <laughs> this year. So it'd be really cool to see everyone from the last couple of years. Uh, and it's great to hear about Legionary and Hunter Clade in different regions of the world where they're still out there chopping people to bits, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When we're not being the ones chopped. Yeah, please. 
<laughs> Pray for the leads, please, please. <laughs> no, yeah. thank you. Thank you, guys, a lot uh, for inviting us again uh, this second year. We hope to see you there. Um, and yes, we are going to... If we manage to go to Atlanta, we'll do our best to to defend uh, the corners of the flag, our country, and and leave a good impression again. Yeah, because uh, I, I I I want to to I don't know how to say to to motivate more people in Latin America to explore this amazing hobby and challenge uh, themselves against uh, the purveyors of the war. Um, and we should go out more often to outside our of comfort zone, our bubble in Latin America, and, and face people like Horizon, Ace, and all the top guys right now, I don't know. Yeah, just the top players around the world, you know, because everyone's yeah. going to be flying into Atlanta one more time, and we'll see how it goes. I think we're going to have way more people this year, so fingers crossed. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for coming on, and thank you listeners for listening until the end.